Preaching and youth. Um, first of all, there are many people who are doing this in amazing ways. And I don't know that all of them would register on your list of um, absolutely fabulous, successful youth programs. I mean, I think one of the things that I want to do is to take a step back um, from what David Eng called long ago, a Christian educator called long ago, um, the entertainment model of youth ministry. You know, that's not, that's not what we're about, I hope. Um, that's very limited, and kids eventually see through that. Plus, we're not very good at it. You know, I mean, there's so much other entertainment out there that's better than we are. Um, I think the primary thing, I, I think maybe this is why the book has taken so long, because I feel like this is kind of basic and, and self-evident, and why should, you know, why do we need another book about this? But um, to encourage preachers to really take youth seriously um, as children of God with their own questions, um, who who deserve to be seen in the text, uh, and not just um, in sort of a passing way, um, you know, a mention about peer pressure or the football team or some, you know, stupid comment about honoring your parents, uh, but that these are these are deep. Um, the things youth are going through at the d particular develop developmental point that they're doing it are the same human questions that we all have <laughs> at various points. They're just doing it at a biological point, at a contextual point, um, where particular things will emerge and be important. Um, the more I think about that, the more I realize that um, many adults are stuck in these same places of adolescence, that there's so much pain that is particular to that time that we don't really work through, you know? And, and I see this in the classroom. Sometimes uh, um, someone will react, a student will react in a really um, powerful way to something that's said, and it turns out it's triggered, it's triggered something that they, you know, about the way people used to, re the way someone used to treat them, or a memory that they had, or some relationship with their parents, which is not to say I think that psychologizing is the answer to all of this preaching, but, to honor that the time in adolescence is filled with very deep um, experiences, sometimes wounds, that we uh, sometimes for very good reasons go over for a while. And um, part of our job as preachers is to keep lifting up these human experiences of um, learning how to be in a community, how to love and be loved. Um, how to find our place in the world, how to uh, negotiate um, um, acceptance and hospitality and um, rejection. I mean, all, all these sort of basic human projects. Um, you know, I think anytime you see a 50-year-old person acting out, what you're seeing is someone who's trying to resolve stuff in adolescence that never got resolved. And um, what are you going to do, shame that person? I mean, I think you have to go into texts in a way that are going to help us continue to explore these things that linger. So preaching in youth. So there's a, there's a way in which I would like our reading of texts to honor the youth that are among us, honor the youth that are within us, um, the ones that have not been reached, um, who have not had gospel spoken to them um, or lived with them, and that this is a bigger project than um, just for the minister of youth. This is a project worthy of the whole congregation and of uh, those who preach. Um, you know, teenagers are all over these texts. And they read these texts in really powerful ways, um, life-changing ways. So that's 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 kind of what I'm thinking about and wanting to make a case for. It's not a new case, you know. It's not a, but it's the kind of thing that um, we all sort of know intuitively, but none of us do. You know, like sure, I could ask all the kids in my church, you know, in my youth group or, you know, the kids I live with about uh, the text. But do I? Well, not often. <laughs>